to Rocky Mountain Prepper. Today we're making some bread. Yes, we're using that sourdough starter that we've already made up and we're making bread with it. So let me turn the camera and bring you along for the journey. Alright, it's going to be six and a half cups of flour. And then three and a half cups of water plus one cup of your sourdough starter. Now you don't have to use whole wheat. You can use whatever you have on hand. I just happen to have this out. Now, it's also going to take a tablespoon, no, it's a teaspoon of salt. I like to put this in now so I don't forget. And then, a, then roughly two, about three tablespoons of honey. That's about right. You can always add more flour to balance it out. And then two tablespoons of sugar. If you have brown sugar, use brown sugar. If you have white, use white. It doesn't really matter. And then the water. Now, this does not. get baked tonight. It has to sit. Great sourdough rises overnight. Partially because the yeast are not as fast. Partially to get you more than enough extra flavor because the longer it rises the more of a flavor you get developed it's gonna seem a little sticky but it's okay As the flour hydrates, it'll be less sticky, and you can always add a little bit more flour to work it in when you get done, or when you're in the morning. Okay, then we just cover it with a clean kitchen towel, and I'll bring you back in the morning to show you what it's like.
See you then. Welcome back. It is the morning. The bread has been rising all night. As you can see, it is much bigger. I've moved all the way over here to the dining room table, so I have room to do the kneading. I just have a bunch of flour here for because we are going to turn it out, punch it down, and start kneading. Now, a lot of recipes will tell you how long to knead. Honestly, I don't know how long to knead it. I go by what the dough is t trying to tell me. Because it'll get a window pane effect. And this is a very sticky dough at the moment, but we're going to be working in a little bit more flour so it's easier to work without sticking to everything. Make sure to scrape everything out of the bowl that you can. It will be going back into the bowl. for a second rising. Just press it out, fold it over, press it out, turn it, just keep working it like this. It's a little sticky for you. Put a little bit of flour on it. And work it back. Work it. Keep kneading. Since it has been sitting overnight, gluten will be present. So it won't take as much kneading as if you were doing this without it having done the first rise overnight. Before you do this, make sure you've cleaned the table very thoroughly because any dirt will get worked into your dough. We don't want that. And this is basically just redistributing the yeast and forming that gluten, which will allow it to hold on to all the gases that your yeast are making. Feels like it's getting pretty close. Now, I am not a professional baker, but I've been doing this since I was a kid. My great-grandparents were cooks in the army during World War II, and they taught me a lot about baking and cooking. Like, I can make food for a thousand people with relatively little. And I've learned over the years how to scale back all the recipes that they taught me. I wonder if they actually knew 
something was coming, like we know. They lived through the Depression, so they knew times can get hard. And this is drying out the dough a little bit because you are adding more flour, which soaks up more moisture. If you do not want your dough to stick to the bowl the next time, use a second bowl, but lightly grease it. Uh, just a little bit of oil or fat in there and it'll keep it from sticking as bad the next time you rise it in the bowl. I'm not going to really worry too much about it at the moment. Yeah, see how it's just breaking? It is not ready. So I gotta keep kneading. When it is ready, it will stretch and it will form what is almost like a the old grease paper, uh, wax paper like look to it that you can hold it up to a light and see light through it. This is going to take a very long time, usually, <laughs> but it is worth it in the end, because without this, your dough is not going to be as fluffy and chewy. It'll be flat and dense. If you don't do this, you'll end up something closer to slightly risen hardtack. And that is another episode. Or video, whatever you want to look at it. Always make sure your hands are as clean as you can get them before you start working. Soap and water. I do have video on how to make soap from your wood ash, leftover wood ashes. After doing this, for a little while you'll realize why making bread was actually forbidden on the Sabbath because they said no work well this is a lot of work And if when you get started doing this, something comes up that you have to take care of, cover it with a tea towel, come back to it in a little while. It's very forgiving that way. You'll have to punch down some of the air pockets as you're doing it, but it's okay. You're just working it in, building the gluten structure to help hold on to all that CO2 and form the nice chewy insides that everyone recognizes as bread. If you notice, I'm not just pressing straight down, I'm kind of pressing out. That way it's stretching it a little more. 
because if you just press straight down, it'll take you longer. You want to stretch it. And when it's starting to get pretty close, the dough will want to shrink back like that. When it's doing that, you can stop, pull a chunk, and then slowly work it with your fingers. See how it tore? Not quite ready. It's getting there though. Stretch is getting farther before it tears. That's a very good sign. So far I've only done this for like 10 minutes. And it all depends on your humidity and your and how strong you are. This will build up your if you do it right, pressing with your gut muscles. This will build up your core strength, your stomach and your back. So you have more muscular endurance. If you start this in the morning, if you start the whole recipe in the morning, you can be doing this in the evening. before you go to bed and then bake it early in the morning so you have fresh bread, baked bread for to eat with breakfast and throughout the day as you're making your next loaf because we're all always practicing and planning for when we cannot just go to the store and buy a loaf of bread that's why we're doing it this way so that we have the skill so that when times are really hard and there's no grocery stores left we can still have our fresh baked bread that and even right now cheaper right now in my area three bucks and you can get some flour once you have your starter just a, another four bucks for some salt and four buck good quantity of salt I might add <laughs> and a three four bucks for some honey and you've got with your starter, you've got bread for months or weeks at least. You can get a lot of flour for four bucks. The salt will last you a very long time. The honey, not as long as the salt, but still it's it's just as good. Try to work in some of the flour from the table. Very long process but oh so worth it now you can find recipes for the no need ones those come off more as like quick breads I'm not a fan of them I feel that anything good you should be working for and hard work to get it makes you appreciate it all the more. That's why when we're in when God kicked us out of the garden of Eden, 
he was he t said for your sake thorns and thistles shall come up from the earth and all the days of your life you shall eat your bread by the sweat of your brow things were a lot easier in the garden so because of our sin we must toil and work for that which is good and tasty You will feel it getting more and more resistant. That's normal. Just keep at it. And every so often, just tear off a chunk, and slowly work it. There. Ah, that's what you're looking for. Just before it tore there, there's a little itty bitty spot where it's starting to show a window pane. That is what we're looking for. So now that we've gotten to that point, we're going to be rolling it into a ball, folding it in on itself, stretching itself out, and back into the bowl covered by our tea towel. All right. I'll bring it back in a couple hours so we can. All right. We're back and it's time to turn it out and get them shaped. Let them rise on the surface we're going to bake with. I've already prepped a sheet pan that I'm going to bake it on with a little bit of vegetable oil so that it'll be nice and slick and won't stick. Now if at any point you have to stop because of life happening, just put it in the bowl and let it rest in the fridge. Let it come up to room temperature mostly. And then it'll be good. All right, I like the oblong loaves, kind of like the French bread loaves and baguettes. Now, we are going to let this rest on the pan for at least 30 minutes because we don't want it to be more or less agitated it needs to rest again 
and then we're going to get it into the oven. So I'll see you back in 30 minutes when we score it and put it in the oven. All right, this is actually the same time that you need to be turning on the oven. I go 500 degrees Fahrenheit to start with. So make sure that that's preheating while this is resting. All right, it's been right around 30 minutes. I'm just using a nice, very sharp slicing knife. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. And I'm just scoring it, getting a nice, deep slice. This dates back to the time before everyone had their own ovens and it was all community ovens. And you had to do something in order to indicate which loaf was yours. So... Old world tradition. Let's just redo these ones here. Now, when I'm doing it in the oven without a Dutch oven present, I always take a metal, all metal saucepan, like this little camping job, and I stick it on the bottom rack. Before I start the oven, I make sure that the rack I'm going to bake on is in the middle. And... Okay, let's get a better view there of the oven. There we go. I put the water underneath. This steams it a bit, allows it to rise and proof for the first 30 minutes and then we'll turn down the temp I'll turn it down to 450 after 30 minutes and then we'll have uh, then we'll finish it off for 20 minutes at uh, 450 so 30 minutes 500 degrees 40 all right, another 20 minutes at 450 come back when it's done all right I've already gone down to 450 for 10 minutes when I did that I removed the pan of water And this is what it's looking like. Here, let me tip it up so you can get a good view. Now, you don't have a thermometer, like most people. Simply, oh, great, it's not going to work. Okay, make sure it's well lubed. Best way to check is the thumb. This is done. Now just you let it sit and cool, and then you can cut into it. And I will show you that in a few minutes. If you do not let it cool, I like to use a wire rack like this. You're going to gum up your knives and the starches aren't completely set in there. Letting it sit out and cool for a little while will give you the best texture. I'll bring you back when it's 
when I cut into it so you can see the bubble, uh, all the air pockets, bubble pockets, all of that. Yeah, the goodies. And I'll let you know what it tastes like. But I sincerely recommend that you take the time to make your own. Alright, bring you back later.